Bart's leadership and Brian's leadership as well in helping us make sure we did a stand-up job. So really thankful for that. Well, as we turn our attention now this morning to God's Word, I would love to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John 11. Uh, we're starting a new section, I guess, a new chapter. This chapter is a pretty significant chapter in the scope of the Gospel of John. There's 57 verses in the Gospel of John chapter 11. And this morning, we're going to look at the first 16 verses and pause there and continue on on Easter Sunday in verse 17. And the Lord has saw fit to allow us to fall right in that resurrection passage uh, on Easter. So I look forward to that. So before I get into the text, if you have family or friends who don't know the Lord, I mean, Easter is like a ripe opportunity to invite someone to church because, you know, people are going to go to church on Easter just because they live in the South. It's sort of a traditional thing to do. So if you have some friends or family that don't have a church home, look at the space we have left after the kids leave where they could sit, right? If you look to the left and right, you kind of see that. So let's be thinking about that, praying about that as the Lord leads us to do that. All right, let's look together, John 11, verse 1, and we're going to read all the way to verse 16. If you do not have a Bible, we have some in the back, so if you need a copy of God's Word, just raise your hand, and Mickey will, will help you out. He'll give one of those to you for you to have and to keep. Well, let's read together, John 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was... The Mary who anointed the Lord, the Lord with an ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard this, that when he heard that he was sick, then he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Therefore, Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us, go also, let us also go so that we may die with him. There are uh, seven signs recorded for us in the Gospel of John. And here in chapter 11, we come to the last of Jesus' signs uh, before he will face the horrors of the cross. And all of these signs that John records for us play a significant role in the evangelistic efforts of the Apostle John. John writes just these seven signs in this letter with the intent to show you and I and his audience that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and by believing that he is the Son of God, that you may have eternal life. This is the whole reason John writes the gospel. And each one of these signs points to this reality. 
the signs themselves, even though they happen in a physical world or in a physical realm, or in a, they illustrate a spiritual principle in the spiritual world. Uh, when Jesus, for example, feeds the 5,000, this illustrates the fact that Jesus ultimately is the bread of life because the discourse carries on with this idea that Jesus tells them, quit starving for the bread that never satisfied. I am the bread from heaven, right? I am the bread of life. So the mere fact that Jesus would create enough food to feed 5,000 plus people was to illustrate a spiritual point. When Jesus heals a blind man, in John 9, why does he do that? Well, he does that to show not only that he is the Son of God, but to show that he is the light of the world. He is the only one who can enlighten the eyes of a darkened, sinful heart. And Jesus does this miracle to prove that very point, to show that spiritual reality. At the wedding in Cana, the first miracle that Jesus does in the Gospel of John, where Jesus turns water into wine, Jesus here, in doing this miracle, shows that He has divine authority, really, over all things. Because His ability to change the molecular structure of water into the finest wine that lips or tongue has ever tasted. But each of these signs, and, and I want you to understand this as we get into this text, each of these signs is that physical illustration of a spiritual principle, right? It's not just to wow you. It's not just to get you to go, wow, that was awesome. But it's a spiritual picture that Jesus is trying to paint and show. Ultimately, in John 10, we've learned that his works are the means by which people are to assess who Jesus says he really is. So the signs that Christ performs, that John records, has that as his goal. To show you Christ. To glorify Christ. To glorify the Father. To glorify Jesus. That's the intent. And each of these signs are going to reveal that Jesus, the seventh sign specifically that we're going to look at in the next few weeks, is a sign that will show that Jesus is the resurrection and that Jesus is the life. And all men and women who will come to Christ in repentance and faith will receive that life. This is why this passage is so critically important for us today. But what we're going to learn today in our passage is that Jesus, as we get into this seventh sign and all the context around it, Jesus does not waste a moment of time to impact those around him. Jesus wastes no minute, no second. He wastes no day. He wastes no circumstance to use it for the glory of God. And we're going to learn that today as we look at this passage. We know that his days on this earth are limited. We know that Jesus spent 33 years on this earth and he spent three of those years pouring his life into the disciples. And here, we're going to see Jesus doing something very unique with his closest friends. So the seventh miracle is placed within a setting that will ultimately stretch the faith of his followers. And I'm convinced that what Jesus is doing in your life today, if you are a Christian and if you are His, He is doing that very work. He is putting your life into that divine uh, vice to squeeze you or to stretch you, however you want to think about it. This is what the Lord is always doing in our lives. He is so working things out in your life to build your faith in Him. So that you will no longer look to yourself. So that you will no longer look to your husband or your wife or your closest friend. But that you will rely solely and completely on Jesus. This is what we're going to learn today. So I ask you this question this morning as you sit there comfortably taking notes. What hardship is in your life today? 
What trial would you say that God has placed you in that is causing you much consternation? Is it relationships? Is it your job situation? Is it a health situation? Is it a troubled marriage? What is that trial that you're facing today that God is sovereignly using providentially in your life to stretch you so that you come to a place of greater understanding who Jesus is and your need for Him? Because ladies and gentlemen, I don't care what your problem might be today, He is sufficient. He is sufficient. And He wants you to learn that. But you will never learn that through a comfortable bed, a comfortable couch. You only learn that through the crucible of pain. You will only learn that Jesus is sufficient in your life. You will only learn that valuable lesson. It's when God applies the providential pressure needed to let you forsake what you're holding on to, to trust Jesus solely. So this morning, as we look at this passage, you're going to see this sort of unfold in these 16 verses. And we're going to follow four headings. And the first heading has to do with the setting of the seventh sign. So we need sort of a context to operate out of because Jesus doesn't operate in the vacuum, does he? He operates in real life with real people. And guess what? Guess what? You are real people that are living a real life. And Jesus here is going to be doing his greatest work in the circumstances of those to whom he loves. So you've got to place yourself within this context or you will miss what Jesus can do for you in your trouble. Let's see, the, let's see what the Lord is doing. Let's see the setting here. Now a certain man was sick. Well, we know who the certain man is. It's Lazarus, right? Lazarus of Bethany. He is the brother of Mary and Martha, two famous women in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when John begins to talk about this scene, he's setting this up for us. John's helping us understand what is taking place. So he tells us here that a certain man was sick, and it's Lazarus. This man, being the brother of Mary and Martha, we find that he is not doing well. He is a sick. He's sick. We don't know if he's got COVID or leprosy, right? <laughs> but he's sick. He's on, the, he's on his proverbial deathbed. He really is. He, and probably by verse 3, more than likely, he's probably already passed away by the time this message gets to Christ. Lazarus is, is that sick. But John here includes in the opening of this, of this chapter that Lazarus is from Bethany, this Little area is a few miles outside of Jerusalem, a critical place, especially in the Passion Week, because whether you follow the Passion Palm Sunday as being today or Monday, uh, if you turn to John 12, you will see that Jesus spends a, a day with Lazarus and his family before that final Passover, before he goes into uh, Jerusalem riding on a donkey. So, Bethany is where Lazarus is from. That's where Mary and Martha are from. It's a little village right outside the area of Jerusalem. And this is a significant piece of geography for us as we think about the last week of Jesus' life. So this is, this is the home of Mary and Martha. That's what Jesus or John is telling us here in verse, um, in verse 1. We're all aware of these two sisters, right? Uh, we're all aware that these two sisters in Luke chapter 10, if you want to turn there with me, I think it's worth our, our viewing, is where Jesus visits their home, and we all, we're aware of what happens there. Um, Mary and Martha um, are contrasted here as two sisters with two different priorities. And Mary here is the one who has the right priorities in verse 38. Or 39, she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the feet of the Lord listening to his words. But look at verse 40. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations and she came to Jesus and said, Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered by so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. What a statement by Jesus about Mary. Her priorities were right. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him. But John also adds a very notable piece here in verse 2 about Mary as well, just showing her devotion to the Lord. It says, It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So John sort of elevates Mary here in this moment just to show that her priorities in her life were right. It was all about Jesus, right? It was all about sitting at his feet. It was all about worshiping Christ. Her priority in her life was not to be distracted by the world, but to worship Christ and him alone. What a valuable lesson that would be for many of us here today, right? Get so busy with so many things, but forget the most important, and that is worship of Christ. This is just a wonderful example for us as we learn from her about right priorities. So this is the setting. We have Jesus, uh, we have John, I should say, reminding us of what's going on here. But then we get into the message. This is sort of heading number two, the message and the response. Notice it with me. I love this section. So the sisters, speaking of Mary and Martha, uh, sent a word to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is Not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now let's just pause there for a minute and see this message in Jesus' response. So the sickness of this certain man, Lazarus, prompts the sisters to send Jesus, what we would say would be a text message, right? A message that would get to Jesus, take probably about a day to get to him where he is at. He's on the other side of the Jordan Uh, So this runner, so to speak, the messenger, would take this brief message, find Jesus. Jesus received this message, and it's a brief message, but it's also an urgent message. Notice the urgency. Lord, behold, listen, right? This would be all caps, right? If you were trying to get someone to pay attention to what you were writing, this is exactly what the messenger, the sisters, were trying to convey. Jesus, this is an urgent message. Something important here is happening. He whom you love is sick. I just want you to think about this for a moment. Here here they highlight Jesus' love for Lazarus. And what I want you to notice as well, there's no plea to Jesus to come. Like, hurry up and get here, right? There is no, you know, Jesus, you need to heal him right now, right? There's none of that. There is an appeal on behalf of the sisters about what they know about Jesus as it relates to his love for them. And Lazarus specifically. Jesus, the one whom you love is sick. And I believe this is significant because I believe these are the words they use because they hope that this compels Jesus to come. And it is quite clear, I believe, too, that the sisters would have known that Jesus didn't have to be there to heal him. Jesus could just speak a word and Lazarus could be healed. Jesus could have left right then and made his way to Bethany to be by their side, to minister to their needs. Many of us, if we hear bad news like this, what is our first response? It is to pack a bag and hit the road, right? It's to get on the internet and try to find the first flight out of wherever you might live, because we feel the urgent need in the moment. We're moved to go and be beside those we love. This is why Martha and Mary send this message to Jesus. But I don't think this message falls on Jesus in a way that they anticipated. I knew, I believe that Mary and Martha knew the power of Christ and they trusted Jesus, right? To do whatever, whatever he thought was right concerning Lazarus. That's why there is no command, so to speak, from Mary or Martha or no request of him. 
But when this news fell on Jesus' ears, Jesus says, what Jesus says here is vitally important for us. Look at verse 4. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. I want you to notice Jesus' analysis of the situation, and he gives some things here that are worthy of our time. First, Jesus says that the sickness will not end in death. Then Jesus goes on to say the sickness will result in the glory of God. And this sickness will specifically glorify the Son. These are the three things that Jesus says as it relates to this situation. Jesus' response to this news is amazing, right? Because he knows the purpose in the pain. He knows the purpose in Lazarus' sickness. Do you think Lazarus, laying on the bed, his deathbed, understood the purpose in his pain? Did he understand why he was sick? Did he gather why this was happening to him? We're not even clued in to any of that. But Jesus sovereignly knows that there is purpose in this. Specifically, Lazarus will be overcome by death. He will die. But that's not the end of the story. Jesus knows that he will, he will die, and all probability at this point is probably already dead because it would have taken the messenger about a day to get to Jesus because it takes Jesus a day to get to Bethany when he decides to travel there. But Jesus here knows there is something greater that's going to take place. Now, remember back to John chapter 9, verse 2, when the disciples saw a blind man. Do you remember this? And the disciples said, Jesus, is it because this man sinned or his parents that he's born blind? Remember that? And what is Jesus' response? He says, it's not that anyone sinned that this man is born blind, but it's so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Well, this is what I hear Jesus saying right here in verse 4. Right here in this passage, Jesus is going to use this sickness, this death, this hardship, for a distinct purpose. Oh, dear friend, listen to me. What a lesson many of you today sitting in this room need to hear. Your pain, your hardship, your trial that you're facing today is not random. It is specific. If there's one thing I love... I enjoy a good fitting shirt, right, Tammy, that fits like it was tailor-made for me, tucks in the right places, it falls on the shoulders the right way, the collar's not too tight, it's just right. Those are great t-shirts and great shirts, we all have them. Listen, this is how God has fashioned your current trial, your current hardship that has entered your life is tailor-made for you. It's tailor-fit for you. I want to show you a passage. It's in Isaiah for just a moment. And it's on Isaiah chapter 45. And I want you to see this with me. Just keep your place in John and turn to Isaiah 45 because I want you to just see how the Lord is sovereignly using all things to glorify himself in your life. Isaiah 45, verse 7. If we really wanted to get a greater grasp of this, look at verse 5. God's speaking here. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising of the set and the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Now look at verse 7. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Listen, God causes all things. Even the calamity that so we think comes out of left field, right? Even the hardships that come from the unknown all come from God. 
Even in this context, Lazarus' death comes from a good God. This is how we have to understand our own circumstances. Because God's purposes in our pain is the point. Lazarus was going to be the means, think of this, by which Jesus Christ would receive all the glory. Listen, no matter your troubles today, your marriage troubles, your personal troubles, all of it has purpose. Jesus has an unsettled resolve in this particular passage because He knows the purpose in this painful situation. Jesus knows the outcome of this situation will be for the glory of God. But I'm aware as well that our response to pain is not this, right? Our response to hardship is usually, Lord, take it away. Get it out of here. I don't like it. It hurts. But the, but the mature saint's outlook is how can God ultimately get the glory in my situation? Listen, dear friend, that is the response of a mature Christian. In this context, Jesus says that He will receive and will display the glory of God in ultimately raising Lazarus from the dead. Look at verse 4. He says, This sickness is not to end in death. Ultimately, it will not end in Lazarus' death. He will raise Lazarus from the dead. And he says, But this will happen for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified. Now look at those last two words. By it, through the trial, through Lazarus' sickness, through Lazarus' death, Jesus Christ is going to be glorified. That's what Jesus is saying. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, it will reveal that Jesus has the power of life and the power over death. That's what that's going to reveal. All of the miracles or for that sole purpose, is to glorify the Son. For what purpose? So that others might believe. Others might see Christ and believe and repent. This is Jesus' perspective here in this passage on this particular situation. And this ought to transform your and my thinking when it comes to trials that we face. Because when Jesus here raises a man who's been dead four days, all eyes are going to be on Christ. The spotlight's going to be on Jesus. And that's what Jesus is saying. The purpose is here. Listen, if the purpose here, think about it this way. If the purpose here is for Jesus to receive the glory through the death of Lazarus, let me just ask you this personal question. How might Jesus receive the glory in your life today when you are amid a trial? If you're facing a trial today, if you're facing a hardship today, how is Christ going to receive glory in it? Well, I'm going to give you some ideas to think about. Number one, one way that Jesus will get the glory in your life from your life is, it, is that you have the right attitude in your trial. If you fail to have the right attitude, it's all about you. That's what you're saying. It's not about Jesus. It's about me. You need to know about my trial. You need to see my tears. Right? That becomes all about me rather than Christ. Having the right attitude is what is critically important when we are in the crucible of pain. You see, the internal is a reflection on what is shown externally. You see, the heart is what others will read because it shines through on the outside, doesn't it? So having the right attitude will transform your demeanor externally. And that will give glory to God. So what is the right attitude when it comes to 
thinking about your trial and thinking about God working in your life. Well, you need to view it in a way that shows you that God is using that to whittle out the trash in your life spiritually. That God is using that refining process of pain to help you grow and be mature. That's the purpose. Look at Romans 8.28. This is the kind of attitude that you need to have. And it will only be, you will only have the right attitude when you understand Romans 8.28. We use this all the time, right? Romans 8.28. And we know that God causes all things. Now stop there. You need to understand that as a Christian. If you do not understand that God causes all things that's happening in your life, you will have a poor attitude about your circumstances. And you'll let everybody on the planet know it. (laughs) And people will begin to go like, oh, here comes so-and-so. Right? We don't want to be that way. We want God to get the glory in our circumstances. Not that we don't share our hurts and pray for me and I'm struggling. No, that's fine. But it's when that becomes all encompassing about who you are. It's reflecting you don't have the right attitude. We need to know here in Romans 8 28 that God is using that in your life. For what purpose? Notice 28, he says, together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to to his purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. When you understand that God is using a trial in your life for a particular purpose, you will have the right attitude. Doesn't mean it's going to be fun. Doesn't mean it's going to be a joy ride. It means that God is using it in your life. We need to have the right attitude. We do not need to be like those who go to the dentist to try to get a bad tooth pulled, right? Get the pain out. We need to have a better perspective. Second thing we need to consider, too, when we're facing a trial, if we want God to get the glory in it, is do the right thing. It's hard to do the right thing when we're hurting, isn't it? But God will get the glory when you choose to do what is right. When we're hurting... We have similar responses to pain, right? Some of us sulk. Some of us get depressed and turn inwardly. Some of us, when we face hardships, get angry, and everybody knows it. But we need to learn to do the right thing. Rather than allowing our emotions to govern us, we need to allow the truth to govern us. And do the right thing. Think of Job. Job in chapter 1, verse 22, God says of Job, through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. And let me just ask you, has your pain and suffering, is it equal to Job's pain and suffering? None of us here are like Job. We need to do the right thing. We need to learn to do the right thing amid pain and suffering. Next, not only should we have the right attitude, should we do the right thing, but we need to have the right perspective. In these moments of trial, we need to remember that God is at work in you. Paul tells us clearly that this light affliction that you're facing is just that. It's light. It's nothing. And he compares it to the glory of eternity. He said this little blimp, bleep, on a map that you're facing, on the radar, right? You're facing today is nothing in comparison to the glory of eternity. So we need to have that perspective. The right perspective is to know that God is using this in your life to make you trust Him all the more. And He's using it to make you like Christ. So when Jesus here in verse 4 says this sickness is not to end in death but for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified in it, we need to remember that there is purpose in our suffering. But I want you to notice further in in verse 5 through 7 what else Jesus does here. Look with me. It says, Now Jesus loved 
Martha and her sister La- and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea. Now, if you're following my headings, the third heading here is a loving posture. So often, as I was thinking about this, so often we as parents, we quickly rush in to try to rescue our children from the mistakes they make, don't we? We try to fly in with a helping hand. We try to right the wrongs with the ink of a pen and the paper of a check. We respond. We try to, you know, rescue our kids from maybe bad decisions that, may, that they make. But we need to learn that we need to let our children experience the pain of foolish actions. Because guess what? Life is full of consequences. And if you do not shepherd your children early on how to deal with bad consequences because of bad decisions, you are not helping your children at all. You're actually setting them up for ultimate failure. But what Jesus does here is delays. He delays. And he delays for a a particular reason. I want you to notice, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus pauses because he loves them. Jesus waits because he loves them. And I think John is helping us see that Jesus has a purpose in his methods. And part of that purpose is to wait. He doesn't fly to help, but what happens? He allows two whole days, 48 hours, 2,880 minutes to go by before he even takes one step Toward Judea. Why? Well, John tells us it's because he loves these men, these siblings. He loves them and wants to use this situation for their good and the glory of God. And the Lord's goal in staying behind two days after receiving this message is so that Lazarus, if he's not already dead, is good and dead. <laughs> But there's a secondary reason here that Jesus waits. It's because he loves these folks. And he wants to use the situation to build and strengthen their faith. You see, this just reminds us too that Jesus is not in the business of making you happy. Jesus is in the business of stretching you beyond your limits so that you might grow. That's what Jesus is doing. That's what Jesus is doing here. Did you know that your muscles will not grow unless they're placed under strain and stress? Well, that's true of your faith. If your faith is genuine, it will be tested through the crucible of sovereign trials in your life. Look at verse 15. Skip down. We're skipping some verses here, but I want you to see this again in another light as it relates to the disciples. Notice what Jesus says here in verse 15. I am glad. Look at that. I'm glad we waited, Jesus says. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. So Jesus here is taking a posture that is unique, right? He's like, we're going to wait. We're going to wait before we go. We're going to let Judas, or not Judas, but Lazarus die. Yes, they've already been converted here in verse 15, but what does it mean when he says, that you may believe. It means that their, growth, their, their spiritual growth might happen from this whole situation. And if you're anything like me, you know that the greatest spiritual growth moments that you've faced in your life have been those fiery furnaces, right? Why? Because you realize you need Jesus in those moments. You realize you need Christ, that you're not sufficient enough in your own strength to weather the storm. You need Christ. Not the comfortable couch of life. It never brings about your spiritual growth. Because you get complacent. Your Bible reading goes down. Your prayer, your faithfulness goes down because you think all things are cool, all things are good. But when something hard comes into your life, what happens? You kind of turn back to the Lord, right? 
You see, the most effective way to build their faith here is not just to heal a sick friend, but to heal or to resurrect a dead friend. That's the point. So when we see this in verses 5 through 6, this is not a cruel delay, but a providential pause so that a greater spiritual impact might occur. Look how this is emphasized in verse 7. Look at verse 7. He says, then after this. Well, John is making the note, after this, meaning after the two full days have went by, it's time to move toward Judea. Look at verse 7. He says, let us go again. Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This is heading number four, the limited time. Jesus knows it's time to move. Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is good and dead. And now it's time to make his way to Jerusalem or to Bethany. But here, the disciples recognize maybe this isn't such a great idea. Jesus, just a few weeks ago, they tried to kill you when the last time we were in Jerusalem. Why should we return? This seems like a reasonable question, seems like a reasonable concern on behalf of the 12 disciples. But Jesus here makes a wonderful response, and I want us to notice it. Look how he uses a 12-hour day to make a powerful spiritual point. Jesus takes this 12-hour day. In 12 hours, what does he say? The sun is up, and then the other 12 hours, the sun is setting. Jesus uses this to make a point. We all know that the sun shines for 12 hours, and then it's dark for 12 hours. This reality is true, really, no matter where you live, no matter what time you've lived in history, this reality is true. It is within this 12-hour day that the sun is up. Look at verse 9. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. And that's a reference to the sun, the physical sun. And if you walk around in those 12 hours, you're not going to stumble. You're not going to fall because the sun illuminates your path. Jesus uses this universal truth to relate to his own personal ministry. And his own personal ministry is on a fixed timetable. You've got to remember that he is responding to their concern about maybe dying, right? Hey, they, they may stone you if you go there again. But Jesus is telling them something totally different. He's reminding them that nothing happens outside God's sovereign timeline. As long as they are walking within that 12 hours of sunlight, the Lord's will... Nothing can happen to them. That's Jesus' point. So they're not hindered. Jesus is not hindered by the fear of man. He's not hindered about possible outcomes of his enemies on his own life. He's not afraid of the potential dangers because his life is governed by a divine timeline and there is nothing that can hinder that work, that purpose. And if we think about this, this is an obvious lesson the disciples needed to learn, right? It's a lesson we need to learn in ministry as well. Ministry is not all glory and glamour. It's hardships and trials. The apostles would know this. And they would need to know not only is that ministry is hard, but that you're not going to die until God's appointed time. You're not going to perish because of the enemies of the gospel until it is God's determined place for that to happen. This is what Jesus is saying. Paul talked about this, hardships in ministry. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 for just a moment. Verse 10, Paul talking to the church at Corinth, and he says, We are fools for Christ's sake. But you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. He's talking about the apostles here. To this present hour, he says, we are both hungry and thirsty and poorly clothed and roughly treated and are homeless 
And we toil working with our hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world and the dregs of all things, even until now. What is Paul highlighting? He's, Paul, he's highlighting the, the hardships of ministry that he faced. And if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says this in verse 8, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who were chosen, so that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Listen, hardships will come, but hardships should not hinder us from serving the Lord. It didn't hinder Paul from serving the Lord. It didn't hinder Jesus from fulfilling His mission, knowing in the sovereign purposes of God, no harm would come to them in until it was God's intended time for Him to face the cross. And this is why Jesus says what He says here in verses 5-6. to six. And then we look here in verse 11. He says to them, and after He had said this, He says, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of his sleep. The disciples said to Him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. So here again, they're like, look, Jesus, there's no needing us going, right? If he's just asleep, He'll wake up. But there's a necessity for this journey. And that's why we're heading for this section here. The necessary journey. And Jesus at this point informs the twelve disciples the nature of their trip. they got to go, ultimately, to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus knows that Lazarus at this point has died. And it's time to leave. It's time to fulfill this seventh sign. And Jesus here uses figurative language of Lazarus' death, and this is why it confuses the disciples, because Jesus says our friend Lazarus is asleep. And this is why the disciples go, well, if he's asleep, he'll recover. Let's stay where we are. It's safe. And Jesus here, though, uses the term sleep to refer to death. And this is kind of a unique term, and I think a sufficient term, an appropriate term, for a Christian's death, but a, because a Christian, when he dies, it really is sleep, because he is awakened into an eternal bliss, right? His eternal reward. The death of any Christian is the glorious graduation into his or her true home. And that's why Jesus says here that Lazarus sleeps. This observation by his disciples, though, would try to remove a need to go to Judea. If he's only sleeping. But then Jesus in verse 14 tells him plainly that Lazarus is dead. And here we see the necessity for them to make their way to Judea. Look, look at verse 15. He says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. This is why this trip's necessary. Trip's necessary. Lazarus' death is necessary. Our pain, our trials, our hardships equally are necessary for what reason? So that we might grow. That's what Jesus is saying here. The benefit is for the disciples. And Jesus here is glad. There is joy in this verse. Look at it. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. So that you may believe. Wow. Just think of it. Do you think Jesus is glad for your struggles today? I think so, right? Because He's going to use those struggles to mature you to be like Jesus. Jesus has the right perspective here. Jesus knows that the disciples need their faith to be enlarged. They need to understand more clearly who Jesus really is. 
if they're going to be his emissaries, if they're going to be his apostles, if they're going to be the ones to take the message of the gospel to the world, if they're going to be the ones who are going to lay down their life, where is the boldness going to come from if they do not understand that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? You see, their faith has to be stretched. Their faith has to be matured. And this is why Jesus finds great joy. I am glad for your sakes that I wasn't there so that you might grow. Leon Morris in his commentary says, there are new depths of faith to be plumbed, new heights of faith to be scaled. The raising of Lazarus would have a profound effect on the disciples and would give their faith a context that it did not have before. End quote. John here includes in verse 16 a little taste of the disciples' faith that needed to grow. Look at verse 16. Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, or let us also go, so that we may die with him. That seems on the outset as sort of a valiant statement, right? But it's really not. It's really not. Let us also go so that we may die too. I guess we've got to go down there and follow Jesus and give our lives. This is old doubting Thomas, isn't it? I'm not going to believe unless I see Jesus and touch his hands and his feet and his side. I'm just not going to believe. I can't believe. Here John records old doubting Thomas here, speaking for the rest of the twelve. This is... Sort of his attitude sort of fits his personality, right? He's gloomy, pessimistic, glass half empty kind of guy. This is not a statement of a man with strong faith. But one that sees their journey to, to Judea as ill-advised and maybe a suicide mission, right? Well, I guess we got to go die. You see, this is the necessary reason for this journey. You see, Jesus is wasting no time, even though he delays two days. Because he's got purpose. He's got purpose in the situation, in the circumstances. And the greater purpose for Jesus in this moment is to stretch the faith of the disciples. Dear church, this is what God is doing in and through you today. This is what he wants to do in and through you today. He wants to stretch your faith. He wants you to quit sulking and start rejoicing in the fact that God is using your hardships for His glory. Can we rejoice in that this morning? Can we rejoice in the reality that Jesus Christ is using our hardships and our troubles to make you like Christ? You see, these 12 disciples that Jesus chose were not perfect men. They were very diverse as the color chart. But their love and devotion for Christ was real and authentic, but not perfected. And this is what Jesus is doing in this passage. He's helping the disciples see and helping them understand who He is and what His purposes are in their life. Listen, dear church, this is what's true even today. Today we love Jesus. We are devoted to Jesus. But listen, some of our faith is weak. Some of our faith is frail at best. And you and I need to learn from this text that our pain in the hands of a loving God has purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your care. We thank you for your care for us. And that you are using all things in our lives to shape and mold us after your image. Just as we see here in this passage how you're using the death of Lazarus. And how you're going to get glory from this death. That you're going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And you're going to transform his life in that moment. And Father, we just want to admit in this moment that we always don't have that right perspective when it comes to our own hardships. We do not have that right perspective when it comes to thinking through the pain and suffering that we may face. No matter how or what we are facing, 
It could seem trivial to some, but it, for us, it's a load. It's, it's a burden. And I pray today, Father, that just from this passage that we would all gain encouragement and strength to face another day knowing that you're using it for our good.